Hello, good morning. How's everyone doing today? Good morning. Hi, good morning. Uh, I wanted to talk about, uh, looks like a few of you have the problems of the pre-lecture not being registered as complete. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, so I have contacted their um, tech support. So hopefully they will get it fixed as soon as possible. Uh, but don't worry about it uh, because even if there some technical difficulty, they couldn't recover it fully in the system, I can always manually change it for your credit to be counted. So um, I'll keep you all posted about, about that. As soon as I hear from them, I'll let you know, okay? All right. All right, so we will continue our discussion about conservation of momentum. We start off with uh, the analogy with conservation of energy, right? The energy uh, change will be accounted by the energy transfers. Now, the same with conservation momentum, if there's a change in momentum of your system that is um, counted by the uh, impulse uh, that the force is doing to the system. So how can you have an impulse? impulse? You apply a force for a certain amount of time and then you have your impulse. But I said 99% of the time we use the conservation momentum in its simplified special cases when there is no external forces or when uh, the external force is applying for a very short amount of time and then we can we can uh, neglect and ignore the impulse and then we can uh, set the right hand side of the equation to be zero so that the momentum final equals momentum initial, which means the total momentum of system is always a constant, it doesn't change. Okay, so let's take a look at a question that uh, we can use conservation momentum to answer. Suppose you're standing on the cart, uh, can you think of this could be a skateboard uh, and this surface is very smooth. It's probably not a good idea, but for the sake of reasoning, it was on a very smooth surface. So this is telling you there is no external force, right? Now, which means if there's no external force, the cart and the person, that entire system's momentum is remaining a constant. So that is what it's telling you. Okay, so it's just the previous equation we saw in the previous slide. So if you throw a ball off the cart toward the left, which way will you and the cart uh, move? Uh, we'll move to the right. Move to the right, very good, thank you. Uh, so that the total momentum still remains zero as it was to begin with. Okay, so uh, before nothing moves, everything is at rest, zero momentum. So if part of the system now is the ball, move to the left, then the rest of the uh, object has to move to the right in order to have the total momentum still remain zero, right? So there is a, another modified version of the same kind of question is, what if you bouncing off the ball uh, um, off on the left hand side, there's a board and you bounce it off. In which way will the cart move? Okay, so you might start wondering, okay, well, uh, when I first throwing the ball to the left, the cart might be moving to the right, but then eventually the, bo the ball is bouncing off, eventually the ball is moving to the right. So I would say it doesn't really matter how complicated the process was, uh, you look at the uh, overall, the final velocity. Okay, at what velocity eventually does it leave the cart is to the right. So you know that overall, the rest of the system, right, other than the ball, uh, will be moving to the left. Okay, so it's really just if one, if one part of the object to this side, the other always to the opposite side. So in this case, uh, the ball moves to the right and the card and the people will move to the left. But if you really want to reason what's going on, um, 
in this process is initially when you throw the ball to the left, the cart will be moving to the right. But as soon as it been bounced off, the cart and your and you get a quick jerk and it starts moving to the left. Okay, so that there is a slight uh, and sudden change uh, in the process, but eventually it will continue just to move to the left. There is a similar question uh, that actually helps with this one. I want to show you this question is, uh, let's say now you are standing outside and there is a curtain or some kind of carriage uh, blocking your view. You couldn't really see what's inside. All you're seeing that you have some heavy uh, balls that's been flying out to the right out of the cart. So as these objects being thrown out, does the cart being put into motion? And if so, which way do they move? Uh, let's do a quick vote. All right, very good. Um, 10 more seconds. Let's wrap up, wrap up in 10 more seconds. All right, let's take a look. I'm going to go ahead and stop it. All right, do you see that this question same or different than the previous one? Is it any different? Uh, feel free to, thank you, Miko. Um, yes, there is not any difference between this question and the previous one. In fact, we uh, modify it into the similar question to help us understand the previous one. Now, if you don't see anything, of course, you are not gonna be confused by what's going on inside. Uh, you will apply conservation momentum to the system. A part of the system is going to the right, the rest of the system has to go to the left if originally everything is staying at rest. So they have zero momentum as before, right? So the previous question, you can view this. Well, what if I couldn't even see what's going on? I can put up a curtain and all I care is the end result that the ball is flying to the right and the rest is flying to, to the left, right? Uh, and this is what we did in the pre-lecture uh, for uh, the astronaut to get back to the space shuttle. Um, is to throw a, uh, a tool to the right-hand side and themselves are able to move to the left-hand side. So because the initial momentum is zero, the final momentum should still be zero, right? Uh, the two parts of your uh, system uh, move in opposite directions. And we, we talked about, we use that to solve, to answer a lot of different uh, questions that, such as why would a gun or cannon recoil? How does a rocket works? Uh, and we 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 uh, were able to explain these uh, qualitatively. Okay, so today we will continue to use conservation momentum to help us understand uh, two types of collisions, because that uh, we use conservation momentum on a type of problems, and oftentimes it involves a collision. Uh, you have seen this in your lab already. We have done an elastic collision and an inelastic collision. Okay, so what is elastic? Um, the word is self explanatory. So uh, if you're thinking about, okay, if it involves like a, 
uh, a, a tennis ball, like a rubber band, um, something um, elastic, that's an elastic collision. Uh, that is where the kinetic energy of your system remains constant. It does not lose any kinetic energy during the collision, but in elastic where you will lose some of your kinetic energy during the collision, right? Um, so there are, uh, let's look at some examples of elastic collisions. For example, um, you have a tennis ball bouncing into a tennis racket and then bounce back. That is a elastic collision, the one we did in our lab. Uh, using the magnetic ends uh, of the cars facing each other. So the cars being repelled uh, and start moving opposite ways. That's an elastic collision. So for a collision, it doesn't really have to touch. Okay, so for the cars, that's also a collision. Uh, for a billboard pool, pair pools, these are uh, rigid balls. They, they bump into each other. That's also an example of elastic collision. Um, of course, it's not 100% elastic. There is a little bit some of kinetic, kinetic energy loss, of course, but there are uh, elastic collisions are good enough of a model to, um, to model these different phenomena as approximately elastic, okay? So let's look at uh, a demo of the elastic collision on Eden's cradle. I probably have seen it before. So this is really like uh, this scenario, right? but we uh, are going to see very um, intuitively how exactly uh, the kinetic energy remains constant before and after. So let's take a look at Newton's cradle. <clears throat> So how are we able to see exactly the kinetic energy remains constant before and after? You can see when this object hits uh, another ball, of course, these ones that's in the middle cannot move. So it's always the one that's on the end moves up, right? It, you can see that they pretty much move up with the same velocity uh, and to the same height. So that is an indication that it, the ball that's been hit and start moving have the same kinetic energy as the ball that was hitting it. The ball that was hitting it completely stops and transfer all of its momentum and all of its kinetic energy to the one that's, um, that's flying out. So now uh, we take up two of these and we'll hit the rest of them. Uh, any prediction what will happen? Two balls will go up. Okay, very good. Let's see. The two will go up, the middle one just stays in place. The three goes up and the middle one kind of just goes back and forth, back and forth with different sets of groups. All right, so that's a demonstration of elastic collision. And uh, this demo is very good because it shows vividly, you can see the kinetic energy remains constant. Let's take a look at this particular question. So what we are seeing is, uh, if you want to draw a picture, is exactly what's being reflected in this question. If you have a, a green block hits another one, there is no friction. So we know again, momentum remains constant. Okay, collides elastically with the red block. And red block initially is at rest. So no velocity at first. And once it hit, the red blocks will uh, move to the right and the green block is at rest. And it's asking us how does M compares to how does the mass of them, two of them, compare? Okay. So, any thoughts on this question? What do you think? I think they're equal, just because one completely stops and then the other goes. So that leads me to believe they're equal. Yes, very good. For elastic collision, 
uh, if one completely stops, which means their mass must be equal, and this one will pick up the same velocity of the green one and continue to go forward. They have the exact same mass. If they their mass were not equal, if m is smaller than the big M, then what happens? What do you think will happen? If this is indeed smaller and this one bounced into the M, so intuitively, if you bounce into a much heavier and bigger object, what happens to the smaller object? Uh, Jacob said it will bounce in the opposite direction. Very good, exactly. It will uh, move in the opposite direction, okay? And then this one will pick up some of the velocities and to go forward. Uh, if the little m is larger, then in this case, the both of them will be moving to the right, just with different velocities, okay? So that's... Uh, three different scenarios what will happen. But if you stop completely, then their mass must be equal, exactly. Uh, you might wonder, well, okay, so how do you know? We can also look at this uh, quantitatively with our equations that the momentum of the system should remain uh, constant, okay? Initially is just mass times V naught. This guy is at rest. And finally, this is at rest, right? So initially, let me write it everything out, is the green block plus the red block was at rest. Finally, the green block is at rest. The red block is moving with some velocity, okay? So that tells me M V naught is equal to big M V prime. There's one more condition is that they collide elastically. So how do you figure out exactly what is V prime? Can't really tell that V prime is equal to V naught right here because um, we still don't know the mass. So what really help us to solve for V prime is the kinetic energy is constant because this is the elastic equation. So if you set the kinetic energy of the system to be constant, again, the big block has no kinetic energy before, and the green block has no kinetic energy after. So if you set everything up, well, this is just zero, you can see that, well, I have this equation, I have this equation, and the only way for this to work out is m is equal to big M and v prime is equal to v naught. So uh, that's how we solve it qualitatively. Okay. So let's look at an uh, example where uh, it's not an elastic collision. Now you have two different boxes. Uh, one collide into another and then they stick. This is like what you did in the lab, they stick. So during that collision, that is very clearly a collision, you have a lot of energy loss. Your kinetic energy is lost. So um, momentum is still conserved, of course. Momentum still remains a constant before and after collision because it's still a frictionless surface. But for this case, the kinetic energy before is not equal to kinetic energy after because this is not an elastic question, it's inelastic. So if we were to compare the initial and final kinetic energy of the system, now we said that they are not equal. Okay, so they're not equal. So exactly how they compare, do you think uh, initial is larger than final or would the final be larger than initial? Which one do you think would be the case? And because there's no energy, um, external force or energy, that means that uh, kinetic energy has to be lowered in afterwards because you can't really just magically come up with more. Yes, very good. Thank you so much. Uh, you can, you have, one had used conservation of energy to argue that 
the you cannot simply come up and create more energy if there's no energy input, right? There are no other forces to put more energy in. So the only way for that is to energy output into the surroundings. You have lost your energy to sound, you have lost it to heat um, or deformation of the object if there is some damage done to during the collision. So you'll, you always come with more than you had later. So the only case for that to happen is your kinetic energy uh, initial is more. But again, we can still uh, argue this uh, quantitatively to look at this uh, using our uh, equations. So to look at why the kinetic energy um, is not equal and which one is bigger is by rewriting your kinetic energy using momentum. Okay, so kinetic energy is one half mv squared. Now, if I multiply uh, an m on the numerator and denominator, I didn't really change the equation, right? Simply multiply an m and divide it by an m. But uh, what on the top is mv squared. mv is momentum. So you have momentum squared divided by 2m. So it turned out kinetic energy is related to momentum squared divided by two times the mass. Why we do this? Because uh, here mass changes. Here you have one M, here you have two M together and velocity changes. If you look at this equation, it will be hard to reason which one is bigger. But if you look at this equation, the momentum remain constant. Okay, so momentum initial is mv, momentum final is 2m times v prime, um, because momentum is a constant, then to compare these kinetic energy, all you care is which one has a bigger or smaller mass, right? So this one has 1m, this one has 2m, so uh, kinetic energy initial is bigger. Okay? And in fact, you probably already um, can calculate what V prime is, is okay, well, if your initial momentum is equal to final, uh, and my initial is one M moving with V naught, this, this other M is at rest, so there's no momentum there. Finally, the two of them stick together, move with the final velocity, right? So the final velocity would be half of the velocity before. You can also cal simply calculate it and plug in into your kinetic energy equations. Um, so this one will have a kinetic energy of one half m v naught squared, and this one will have one half two m v naught over two squared. So um, actually, this one is four times more than the final kinetic energy. Okay, any questions so far about um, the comparison of kinetic energy for this inelastic collision? Any questions? You know, feel free to also um, type whatever you want to ask or want to say. So then, do we apply this only when we're, do when we're dealing with sticking collisions? Uh, we apply, okay, so what do we apply exactly? So like, I'm confused about, um, so I understand the relationship between kinetic energy and momentum, mm -hmm. but um, I'm confused in terms of like the velocity and how it changes. Okay, all right. So, I was showing two different ways to get that relationship. Um, we said, okay, PF equals P initial. This applies to both type of collision, elastic or inelastic, doesn't matter. This always applies, okay? But for elastic, kinetic energy is equal, but for inelastic, kinetic energy is not equal. So we are looking at one of these cases to see if kinetic energy is P squared over two M, right? Um, so in the case uh, of the previous question, initially 
you have um, one m p squared over one m, and finally you have uh, p squared over two times two m. So you can see exactly they are. Oh, actually, it's doubles. I'm sorry, it's not four times. So this initially initial kinetic energy is twice as much as your final kinetic energy. So this is one way to look at it. Uh, any questions about this particular method? I think you were asking about the next method, right? Yeah. Okay, so the method two is, well, uh, never mind writing it out like this. Let's just solve it. Initially is equal to final. Initial, you have one M that is moving. Finally, you have two of them moving together. So I know final velocity is half of your initial velocity. So this I got from applying conservation of momentum. And then you can compare the kinetic energy. Kinetic energy before it collides is just the one M moving. The kinetic energy final is you have 2m moving together with this final velocity, which is one half v naught squared. Okay, so uh, this one is going to be half of the kinetic energy initial. So no matter where, uh, what do you do? You get the same answer as above here and here. Does that, did I answer your question? Yeah, I got it now. Thank you. Okay, and uh, there is also a question in the chat. Is the equation K equals P squared over 2M only for elastic collision? That works uh, generally for all type of collisions or, um, or it doesn't matter if you don't have a collision because K is, uh, kinetic energy is one half MV squared and momentum is MV. So this equation is always true. So this is always true. Okay. Doesn't only work for in elastic, it works for everything. All right, thank you all for that question. Now let's look at inelastic collisions. So inelastic collisions where you can see that um, there is some loss of your kinetic energy. In particular, the ones that we can solve in this class is a perfectly inelastic. So perfectly is just 100% inelastic. Now, what is 100% inelastic? Uh, is that when the objects stick together and move together. So you can see that um, if you have a partially inelastic, like, okay, you have a collision, but then the, the red or the green and the uh, and yellow car um, bounce to each other, smashed into each other, but they move off in different ways. They still move separately uh, after the collision. That's still an elastic, inelastic, but is not 100% inelastic because they did not stick together and move together. We only look at when it's perfectly inelastic because that's the only place, uh, only problem we can solve. When they move in different directions, then it's, uh, we don't have enough conditions to solve. When they do move together after collision, because they will have the same final velocity, and you can combine that with the conservation of momentum, and you can solve for the final velocity just like how we did here. Okay, so that is the one scenario we will always evaluate: is either elastic or perfectly inelastic. Partially inelastic, we cannot solve. Okay, so now let's look at, at the, another demonstration uh, shows both of these cases and compare the difference uh, of these two cases. Uh, it's called a happy and sad ball uh, demo. The happy one is uh, very bouncy. When you use a happy ball and, and bounce off this uh, piece of block, it would bounce right back because it's very bouncy. So you can see that collision happened right there is a elastic collision. The sad ball is made of different material. When it hits this block, it simply just lies there. It does not bounce back. We'll use each of them um, and try to knock over this piece of block. Okay, so we wanna see which one is more likely to knock it down. 
So we will start with a uh, prediction. Simply put in your intuition. Which one do you think is more likely to knock over this piece of block? We will release them from the same height, of course. Then we will take a look at uh, the demo to see if our prediction is correct. All right, um, so if you haven't put in your prediction, feel free to put it in now. We will wait for 10 more seconds. Okay, any more last minute prediction? I'm going to end this and let's look at our prediction. So uh, slightly more voted for A kind of kind of even between uh, A and B, and also maybe it doesn't make a difference which one is used. So let's take a look at this demo together, to see if that confirmed with our prediction or different. All right, today I wanna to show you a little bit about elastic and inelastic collisions. Right here, we have a mallet, which has two different. So they, instead of using different balls, they use this little T-shaped um, um, device. Rubber ends to it, one says happy, and the other one says sad. What we mean by this is the sad one, when it hits this surface, is going to just not bounce back. But if I flip this around, the happy side is the side that when it hits the object, it bounces back. Now, if I swing this uh, mallet back far enough and release it, one of these is going to make the brick fall over. Which one, the happy side, the bouncy side, or the unhappy side? Well, let's try it with the happy side. Let's see what happens. I'm gonna pull it back as far as I dare, and here goes. That one did it. On the other hand, if I switch it around, so that the sad side is facing. Let's try to reproduce this as much as we can from the last time. When we pull it back as far as we dare, and release it, nothing happens. Why does this happen? One way we can think of it is that when the sad one. Okay, so we don't need them to explain for us. So you have seen that the answer is A, okay? The happy ball uh, tend to knock over uh, the block more easily. So uh, there are quite a, a majority of you guys have chosen A, or maybe um, that was different from what you see, or what you think, but you see it differently now. Any thoughts on, <clears throat> any thoughts on the explanation um, using conservation of momentum? Anybody would like to share their thoughts? You can also type it in the chat if you like. I will wait um, <clears throat> wait a little while to see if we get any thoughts coming in, or uh, if you like to speak up, feel free to do that as well. Um, 
I guess since um, conservation of motion kind of says that um, the momentum transport has nothing to do with the external forces. And so since the only forces acting here are the mallet and the block, mm -hmm. um, we need to have um, the force of the mallet equal to zero in order to um, adequately knock down the block and in order to do so. Um, so if a, the ball uh, that's holding the mallet goes into the right direction, then um, it needs to do the same thing for the left direction in order to have um, any, a force powerful enough to knock over the block. Okay, so you were looking at the force that's being applied to the block, right? Yes. Okay, that's one way to think about it. Uh, in that case, I believe you're choosing the block as your system. Um, then, then you're looking at, okay, well, there is a change of the momentum of the ball. The ball's momentum has changed from mv naught for the sad ball. It changed from mv naught to zero because it just stays there. For the happy ball, it changed from mv naught to the happy ball bounces back to what? To negative mv naught. So there is more of a change of the happy ball, its momentum. So there is much the, a bigger force applied to the happy ball um, than the sad ball. So Newton's third law tell us, well, that force is also being applied to the block. So there is a more of a force applied to the block. And uh, the, so the block is more likely to be knocked over for the happy ball. Very good. That is uh, one way to, to do it. Uh, but it's slightly more, actually more, uh, more difficult, I would say. That's a more difficult argument. If you, view, if you were to view the, uh, the ball and the block together as one system, okay? So let's see what else comes in the chat. Uh, deformation of the sad ball robs the system's kinetic energy. That's also a very good way to think about it, Jacob. Uh, the kinetic energy that the happy ball uh, had before and after. Well, I can think of this, well, the, if there is a kinetic energy coming in, right, this is kinetic energy one half mv squared. Um, and it's not lost at all. Uh, maybe part of that is being transferred to your block. Whereas uh, with the sad ball, uh, so, but, but the, with the happy ball, you can see it also comes back with almost equal negative kv naught. So the kinetic energy after is very close to the kinetic energy before. So even if it's not lost, it's also transferred. Um, you can see also it's, okay, where would that come in into giving the kinetic energy to the, to the, uh, to the block? One says the happy ball was likely to able to transfer kinetic energy more efficiently. All right, so that was um, also using the idea of kinetic energy. What if we were to look at conservation of momentum? Okay, so let's see if we uh, are able to use conservation momentum to explain this phenomenon. Let's treat the ball and the block as an entire system. Okay, so the initial uh, momentum of the uh, system is mass of the ball times velocity of the ball, uh, and block was at zero. And the final momentum of the system is mass velocity final of the ball and final velocity of the block, okay? Um, the thing is that the sad ball ends with zero momentum. So, which means if the sad ball ends with zero momentum, then the block will pick up the initial momentum mv. But the happy ball ends up with negative mv. So this is a sad ball. Uh, is zero momentum, but the happy ball end up with negative mv. So we can see that in this equation for the block to pick up two mv of your moment of the momentum. So both cases the momentum remain constant. Uh, so both cases the momentum has to be mv. Okay. So the momentum has to be mv no matter what for the sad ball the MV splits between zero of the ball and MV of the block. For the happy ball, 
this MV that comes in is split between the ball that has negative MV. So that block has to be more in order for them to still add up to the MV, right? So the block will have more momentum uh, after collision. So that's how we were able to use conservation of momentum to talk about this. It's a little bit more, um, I think in terms of math, it's a little bit more rigorous than, uh, than to talk about the uh, kinetic energy. Any questions on this particular demo that we saw and uh, the, different, the different ways we try, try to figure out the answer? Any questions so far? Um, I'm not sure if this makes sense, but if the block has um, twice the momentum, then how would it um, affect the kinetic energy? Because based on what I understand, um, kinetic energy is um, fixed in this state, right? It's not destroyed nor it's um, no more is made. So um, how would this apply here if the momentum is twice as much? Uh, sorry, say your question again. Don't think I fully. Oh, sorry. That. Yeah. No, I'm saying, um, so understanding the relationship that there is between kinetic energy and momentum, um, if the block has twice the momentum, then how would it affect the kinetic energy? Because the kinetic energy can't be, um, neither destroyed nor fixed. It just kind of like, um, exchange between, um, um, between the block and the ball. So, um, if, for instance, the, the block has twice the momentum, then how would that affect the kinetic energy? Uh, you're saying how would the momentum affect the kinetic energy of the system? Yeah, since um, the block has twice as much as momentum. Uh, Oh, I think I know what you're saying. Okay, let's, okay. I think I understand what you're saying now. Let's uh, try to work out with our math to see how it, how it works. So if the block has of a mass of capital M, okay, so M and big M, they're not equal. What comes in is MV naught. And in the case of uh, the happy, let's work out the happy is MV uh, negative, almost negative MV not plus capital M and V final of the block, okay? So we did say, yes, MV final is two MV, but we're not, this is not meaning, a uh, more momentum doesn't mean more kinetic energy overall. So what would, how would it transfer effect energy as you ask is what is the kinetic energy? The four is, one half m v naught squared. Uh, okay, so v final is going to be two m v naught over capital M. Uh, well, this is a okay. So this is a reason that we said approximately. It, it's good enough for this argument, but we should really shouldn't say it's exactly uh, bounces back. Because if it exactly bounces back, uh, then you're right, then kinetic before and after should be exactly equal. Um, it's good enough for our momentum argument, but we shouldn't set it up to be negative V naught. Um, we should probably do um, V prime and say it's, uh, it's close to V naught, but not 100%. So V uh, final of the, of the ball, I'm just gonna call this one as in this two. It shouldn't be exactly equal. So V final of the ball is, we say it's approximately V naught, but it's not. You can set it to be, let's say 80% of your V naught. Okay, so if we set it to be 80%, so MV naught is a negative 0.8 MV naught plus capital V MV final. So V final of the block is about uh, is about two mv, but not exact, and it has to be not exact. 
okay, in order for the momentum to work out. So for the momentum final, you have one half and uh, half of, um, sorry, 80% of your kinetic energy per a squared plus the little part that's coming from your, uh, from this guy. Okay, so, and, and it's possible to set this to be equal to each other. You're right. Um, this is approximation. It cannot be exactly equal. Did I answer your question? For the sad ball, you can safely put that as in zero. And, and then kinetic energy before is one half mv naught square and kinetic energy final is one half capital M V final squared. And these are not equal to each other. Does that make sense, Berenice? Yeah, it makes a little bit more sense. You're, you're, you have a very good point. Uh, this is good enough an approximation in opposed to, um, in terms of the argument of the difference between happy and sad ball, uh, it's close enough. But if you wanted to set up the energy equation, uh, obviously it cannot be exactly uh, the same. Otherwise the kinetic energy would not be uh, uh, equal before and after. You will end up with more kinetic energy after than you had equal. So what happens is the ball still has most of its kinetic energy uh, after the collision and the block pick up a little bit of its kinetic energy. Very, uh, very good question. Now you can see this one is very similar to the one you had uh, with the demo that's from your pre lecture. If you have um, two different scenarios, one is um, knock into this box, bounces back, this one sticks, which box end up moving faster? Well, this is just like the demo is the bouncy one that's been, uh, uh, that will move faster. The bouncing collision will move faster. Okay. All right. So we'll move on to uh, a quick summary of what we've been discussing so far. For both type of collisions, you have uh, energy, uh, momentum conserved. So momentum final is, e is equal to initial. So in the collision that involves two different objects, the initial momentum A and B combined should equal to momentum A and B final. So this happens and works for both collisions. But for different type of collision, you will have uh, one extra equation. For elastic collision, the kinetic energy doesn't change. So you said the kinetic energy equal to each other before and final. That gives you one more condition. So oftentimes we combine these two equations to solve the problem. For inelastic, uh, inelastic, when it's perfectly inelastic, the two objects have the same velocity. So this you combine with your momentum equation to solve the problem. A lot of times we kind of skip this step. We just skip. We just simply say MA plus MB. They move with the same final velocity uh, for the momentum final. So we simply just write this right away. But you can see that there is the fact you can write them into using one final, um, final momentum is because of this condition. Okay, so um, if it's elastic using this equation and this equation, and that it's inelastic, uh, use this equation and this condition. You could directly jump to uh, writing the final velocity to be the same for both of them. And in fact, in real, in, in, in our practice, we do that quite often. Uh, all right. So um, we'll start with talking about this example. Maybe we won't have time to finish. This is an example of a perfectly inelastic collision. Oftentimes, our uh, conservation of momentum problems are combined with a conservation of energy problem. So you can have, uh, you will have to use um, both approach in the same problem. 
So um, there are two air cards. And then again, it's called air cards because the track is coated with air. So there's no external force where you can use the momentum conservation in its simplified format. Initial equals final. A bounce into B with velocity V naught. Uh, B was at rest and they lock together. So this tells you it's an inelastic collision and perfectly inelastic. They lock together and they slide off. Okay, so uh, it's asking what is the speed of the cart right after the collision and after the collision, they start to slide with some friction. Now you have turned the air track off and how far they can slide. So we can break this down into two different sequential problems where first is a collision problem and the second is a sliding problem. The first problem, we use uh, momentum conservation to solve it. The second problem we will the second part, we will use energy conservation to solve it. Okay, so we will pick this up and uh, solve it at the beginning of our Wednesday class. And, and then we will continue to look at more examples uh, using conservation of momentum. Um, and oftentimes it's combined with conservation of energy. Okay, so uh, that's all for today. I will see you on Wednesday. And I'll make an announcement on Canvas if I hear anything back about the glitch with your pre-lecture. So um, don't worry about it, okay? All right, bye everyone. I'll see you on Wednesday. Bye, thank you, Professor. Bye-bye, thank you, have a good day. Professor, thank you. You're welcome, bye-bye everyone. Oh, Professor. Yeah? About the pre-lecture, um, I also wanted to say that, um, like, for instance, when you go back, like, if you want to go back and watch pre-lectures, at least for me, it always deducts points. Like, it says, like, oh, it's 20% late, even though, like, I already, like, finished it and, like, I'm just, like, going back to, like, so revisit. When, okay, so when you, where do you see this 20%? You see this in your grades? If you open up and Um, are you there, Bernice? Sorry, I think you have some. Yeah, sorry, I froze. Yeah. Um, are you still there? Yeah, I keep freezing. Sorry. And you see this in your grades. Why don't you? Mm, Let's say for one of the pre-lectures that had this particular problem, you watched it uh, and then you watched again, it deducted points. Why don't you take a screenshot of that screen and I can go back and check it, what's going on, okay? Okay. Yeah, send an email to me. Okay, okay. will do. Thank you. No problem. Bye-bye.